Hello and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Integration of Primary Care and Mental Health, a Primer. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handout, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, CE credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses, expiring on June 30, 2017, and two years for social workers, expiring on June 30, 2018. I'm Carolyn Byrne, Director of Community Affairs at the Alabama Department of Public Health. I would like to thank the National Council for Behavioral Health for providing support for today's program. And now I would like to welcome our presenter, joining us by phone today. Dr. Jeff Capobianco is a Senior Consultant and Director of Practice Improvement for the National Council on Behavioral Health. Welcome, Dr. Capobianco, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's good to be here. And I'd like to welcome people to ask questions as I go through my presentation. I tend to talk quickly, so I recommend that if you can download the slides and take a look at them, that you have those, those handy so you can keep pace with me. We've got a lot of information to go through today, so let's discuss our learning objectives. Today, we're going to go through some critical components that we've seen at the National Council the requirements for organizations that are moving forward towards integrating primary and behavioral health care. So we're going to talk about some of the market forces driving the need for integrated health care. We're going to learn about how to go about integrating based on your state, regional, and provider factors. By this I mean all health care is local and it's affected, your ability to roll out integration is affected by what state you're in, what zip code you're in, and what your local community providers are doing. We're also going to talk about clinical and financial outcomes associated with integration, looking at the research we have to date on the clinical effectiveness and the cost savings that come out of integration. We'll talk about the six levels of behavioral health and primary care provider integration, and then we're going to get into um, some detail around clinical and administrative components. So if you're a provider organization looking to integrate services or further integrate services, if you've already um, started doing that, what are some of the clinical and administrative components you need to have in place to be successful to do that? As I mentioned for the presentation overview here, um, as I mentioned, I do talk quickly, as you can probably tell. So please just ask questions as you go. The way I've structured this presentation is I'm going to first talk a little bit about the terms I'll be using through the presentation because there's a lot of terms today in healthcare specific to integration. I'll be talking about what's driving our movement to integrate, as I mentioned before, you know, factors associated with um, integrating, outcomes associated, and then we're going to take a deep dive with the business and clinical components of successful integration. Specifically, I'll be looking at organization change management, creating and maintaining partnerships, redesigning administrative and clinical workflows, and then we will have time at the end, uh, once you've gotten all this information to say, okay, where, where do I begin? What do I do with this? So we'll get into some questions and answers, uh, hopefully, and some good discussion about what you're doing and where you want to go with this. So as you can see with this slide, so many terms, so much is happening. We are now in um, 2016. The Affordable Care Act was rolled out in 2010. It's kind of hard to believe it's been five years. Yet many of the terms you see on this slide are still not fully defined or understood um, by many of us due to lack of clear policy or research around it. We are still very much in a time of change. And many of these terms are still being um, unpacked. So defining our terms, how we define a term, 
is critically important. If you're a leader within an organization, if you're a leader at the state level, if you're a staff person working on the front line or you're a customer receiving care, the terms that are used in healthcare today have to be understood by all of those stakeholders. The reason for this is we have so many terms we're throwing around and people have different definitions of them. If you have staff that don't fully understand what you mean by care coordination and they, they take their own spin on it, they're going to do different behaviors in their workflow than a leadership might want them to do. So terms, as we know, words, terms, drive our belief systems or our mental models. And from our belief systems and our mental models, we uh, act. So our behaviors are directly linked to the way we define terms and the way we organize terms into our belief system. So in looking at integration terms, some of the integrated health term sources um, can be pretty confusing. So let's look at integration, for example. In the research literature, you'll hear the term collaborative care being used synonymously with integrated health. And the reason for that is in the research literature, collaborative care is an evidence-based practice for depression treatment that many have walked over and defined as that's integrated health. Many of you are probably aware of the AIM Center at the University of Washington, at Washington State, the IMPACT model, which brought depression care into primary care. Lots of research showing that this is effective. It's defined as collaborative care. On the policy side, you'll hear terms like health home being synonymously um, linked with integrated health. Health home is a policy term that comes out of the Affordable Care Act and specifically speaks to states that want to use funding to design integrated approaches for people who have severe mental illness and chronic physical health conditions. And I'll get a little bit more into that in a bit. So health home is a policy term. If you turn to our accrediting bodies, whether it be the National Committee on Quality Assurance, you know, NCQA, or CARF, the Commission on Accreditation for Rehabilitation Facilities, they all have their own terms for integrated health. Some of them, like NCQA, use patient-centered medical home. Um, CARF has its own uh, health home accreditation you can get as a provider. So that adds to some of the confusion. And then finally, provider agencies go about defining integration in their own way. And you, I've worked with many agencies across the country that call their program patient-centered healthcare home. So they kind of mix the policy and the accreditation terms together. So I speak to this because if you're a leader, if you're a staff person, don't run off and start engaging in integration unless you really are clear on how your organization, how you as an administrator or a clinician are defining your terms because the way you define them will drive how you go about rolling out integration. The next slide is the defining integrated health here. You see a tree, and I really like this slide. It comes from the AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and quality, AHRQ, if you Google that, you'll find their website. It's a federal agency. They do really great work and have a website called the Integration Academy. In that website, you'll find this slide, which, again, gets into the, all the different terms we see being used in uh, the field right now that are synonymous with integrated health. And Ben Miller at the University of Colorado came up with this and his, with his team really like it, really um, suggest you go to the AHRQ website and uh, poke around because there's some great resources there. So one, just two more slides on terms here before I move on. Um, terms worth spending the time to define as an organization, as, as a clinician, as an administrator. And we can take a deep dive into each of these, but each one of these could be a whole presentation unto itself. But I put this list here just because you really have to sit down with your leadership team and, and nail down these terms so that your staff are clear and your clients are clear as to what you're talking about. So population health management, how it is related to or different from continuous quality improvement, population health management being the approach where we can start to see improvement across whole groups of people um, by leveraging our care pathways and leveraging our electronic medical record and registry. So taking an approach to care provision that allows our clinicians to redesign their clinical workflows so that you can actually treat all folks with diabetes as opposed to just having to treat one person at a time. 
care management, care coordination. Care coordination is a, is a part of care management, a really critical part of care management, but um, it's not completely different. So as we talk about, you know, many of you in Alabama are looking at integration. Care management is the, the ability for you as a clinician or an organization to help an individual patient manage their care. Population health management is your ability to help groups of people manage their care by leveraging different clinical pathways, different interventions. And care coordination is your ability to share information both with the patient, their natural supports, but really importantly with your provider network. So that care coordination piece is critical. And you see many of the metrics that the uh, federal government are pushing out are metrics associated with care coordination, things like uh, medication reconciliation, uh, sharing of information between providers. Team-based care and interdisciplinary teams, uh, this is becoming an emerging evidence-based practice, the ability to put together a team that's interdisciplinary and is able to affect change for, for consumers it serves. NCQA now has one of its requirements as team-based care, so that's one of the standards they hold healthcare providers to. Do you, are you able to organize a team? And are you able to field that team in a way that uh, produces good outcomes? Whole literature around how to do that. Scope of work, scope of practice. This, these are terms you're going to see uh, play out in your workplace. As outpatient masters of social work therapists are told, hey, you've got to learn about diabetes, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, what they're going to say to you as a supervisor many times is, I didn't go, I didn't want to become a nurse. Why do I have to learn about this stuff? I don't, I do mental illness and some substance abuse treatment. And the message to them is, yes, your scope of practice is specific around mental health and substance abuse treatment, but your scope of work, which is kind of a broad set of skills you need to have, all of our staff need to have, has also to do with the ability to identify and link and coordinate treatment around these physical health conditions. No, we don't want you to become a nurse or even a, you know, a limited licensed nurse. We want you to have a set of skills associated with physical health so that you can be good at doing this integration, care management coordination. On the next slide, um, you'll see some terms that uh, many of you are probably hearing that we're seeing on the Medicare side. Many of you are in the Medicaid side is my understanding. On the Medicare side, there's a big movement at the federal level around value-based purchasing and episodes of care. These are terms that are used to describe different ways of linking cost to quality outcomes. So if you think of value, good value in healthcare, the idea is you get what you pay for. So with value-based purchasing, no longer is it a fee-for-service model where you get paid for a procedure. You're going to get paid if that procedure, whatever you do as a health care provider, actually produces a good health care outcome for the patient. So that's the value they're going to purchase good outcomes. Episodes of care are this movement towards uh, being able to describe how much it costs to move someone from one place of health to a better place of health. So if someone comes to you and they have high blood pressure, how long does it take you to identify that high blood pressure and get that person's blood pressure within normal limits, so a normal blood pressure, 120 over 80. That episode is the time it takes for you to go from screening, treatment, and recovery or bringing that illness within a normal limit. That episode is a certain period of time and can be paid for for a certain amount of money if, on average, you know how much it costs for you to treat the average person with high blood pressure. The federal government is struggling to figure out these value-based purchasing and episodes of care models, and they will continue to struggle with it, which gives us time to think about how to do this well and explain it to our staff. Finally, I'll just mention treat to target and stepped care. Um, these are two approaches that are very similar but different. Um, treat to target is, you know, we are all going to have to move to the understanding that everyone who comes into our centers is coming in at a certain level of health, and we need to set up targets where they're going to move towards achieving those targets, which is a better place in health. So if I come in and I have schizophrenia and I don't believe that I have schizophrenia, a treat to target for my 
my patient with schizophrenia would be that they're either pre-contemplative or active stage. They come to the point where they say, yeah, I do have uh, schizophrenia. I will work with you around it. The treat the target is this goal we have that we develop with the patient to achieve. Stepped care is this notion that we're going to step people up and down to care based on their level of readiness. So if I come in and I don't believe I have schizophrenia and my treat to target is that I'm going to get this guy to believe he at least has a mental illness that I can help him with, I'm going to step him up to more intensive care till he gets to the point where he's able to see, yeah, I need this help, which means I might put him in a sort of community treatment team or I might provide some wraparound services. As he gets better, um, I'm going to step him down from care. I'm going to provide him fewer or different resources based on his needs because he's on his path to recovery. He doesn't need a high level of care. So I understand I moved through these terms quickly, um, but I just wanted to lay the framework because all these terms uh, provide us the foundation upon which we're going to be able to do integrated health because integration is a systems level change. It's not about implementing an evidence-based practice one certain practice for one certain condition. It's really a system change. The next side, we finally get to define integration, and I'm going to use the simplest definition. You'll see the reference in my reference section. Uh, simplest level, integration is bringing behavioral health, which is defined according to the Affordable Care Act as mental health and substance abuse treatment. It's bringing behavioral health and physical health care together. So. This can happen in uh, a couple different ways, and on the next slide you see you can either bring specialty behavioral health care into the primary care setting, or you can bring primary health care into the behavioral health setting, or as we'll see in a, in a couple slides, you can do the work of just linking those really well together, so you don't actually have to bring clinicians into the same building, you can actually have just really good, good care coordination. On the next slide, you'll see um, eventually we want integration to be a word we don't use anymore because, in essence, integrating healthcare is just good healthcare. So when we describe what good healthcare looks like, it really looks like this: superb access to care on the left-hand side of this, this slide. Um, people can come in during a time that's convenient for them and get their care. We see this happening across the country, uh, Walgreens, CVS, Sam's Club, they're all putting uh, primary care into their buildings because they know it's convenient. They know that if they can get uh, patients engaged when they're shopping uh, because it's convenient for the patient to just walk over and talk to somebody, that they're going to be able to have a larger part of the market share in healthcare. So for us as behavioral health providers or primary care providers, we really need to look at our front door and see if we can improve our access to care for people. Patient-level engagement, really need to move from just engaging people to activating them. So getting to the point where we're not just sharing information with patients, but we're actually getting them to change their behavior when they get home. Clinical information system redesign, I'm sure you're all looking at or in the process of tweaking your electronic health record. Many of us don't like our electronic health records, but they are getting better and they are the driving force from around our ability to do things like population health management. Care coordination, as I mentioned, critical that we all start thinking of ourselves as being providers in a provider community and that we're working closely together and sharing information. Team-based care, as I mentioned, patient feedback and then publicly available information. Um, we see a lot of scorecards being developed and patients, consumers are going to be able to pick and choose uh, between providers, no longer is behavioral health or even federally qualified health centers, community health centers, going to have a monopoly on delivering care to these safety net uh, patients. We have to be becoming more competitive in our uh, financial, or as I should say, our, our health care marketplace so that we can uh, show value and make sure that we are viable as this health care system changes around us. So what are the factors driving the need for integrated health as we move forward in the presentation here? If you um, are familiar with the history of medicine at all, there's been a long history around integration, and it's nothing new. 
we all know, you all know, if you've been in the field for a while, treating the whole person is the goal. We just haven't had the structure in the United States to be able to do it. We've all known it's good. Hippocrates, Hippocrates, Hippocrates knew it was good um, way, way back 300 B.C. We have seen, and if you look at this map of the world here, um, we have seen in the last decade or so uh, a resurgence of research showing that people with severe mental illness um, have a very bad outcome when it comes to physical health. And on this map, there's a big gold arrow pointing to Sub-Saharan Africa where we know those countries are in the middle of war and are ravaged by AIDS. The lifespan in these Sub-Saharan African countries is the same as the lifespan for a citizen in the United States that has a severe mental illness. The reason why people are dying at a young age with these severe mental illnesses is because they're not getting good primary health care. They're not getting access. And it's not the fault of primary care. It's the fault of our system. We haven't integrated well. So the hope is that we can integrate services to bring up the, the uh, life expectancy of all of our citizens, including the ones that have severe mental illness. Another driver is probably the biggest driver, which is this next slide that has the uh, exponential rise of cost. This goes up to 2010 of the Affordable Care Act. We've seen a little bit of a dip in 2012, 2013. Um, so there, depending on how you do the statistics, there is evidence to show there has been some reduction in health care expenditure, but we're still not out of the woods in figuring this all out. And it's still not clear what we're doing really is cost effective. But this is probably the biggest driver for why we see integration being pushed. And all of these come together in the next slide we're around this triple aim, which um, I think many of you remember. Don Berwick, former director of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and the recess appointment by President Obama as the director of the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Um, he brought forward this triple aim. In the next slide, you see this, this notion of population health, improving the health of groups of people, not just individuals, but really as organizations mobilizing to impact groups of people, not just one person at a time, but figuring out ways to help one person at a time, but also design services that are going to help whole groups of people. Bending the cost curve, as we mentioned, you know, reducing costs, and then improving the patient's experience and quality of care. It's no longer okay for healthcare to simply engage someone. Uh, there was a great book written by Alan Deutschman called a Change or Die. He had developed a cardiac condition, yet didn't take any of the advice of his cardiologist and kept eating poorly. And he was thinking to himself, why am I doing this? Why am I killing myself? And he investigated how the healthcare system engages patients. And what he found was they primarily use fear, facts, and force. They say, hey, if you don't stop eating steak, you're going to die from this cardiac disease. Here's some research showing that I'm right. And, oh, by the way, I'm a doctor. i got a white coat and a stethoscope. You really should listen to me. So this fear of facts and force works for some people, but what we're learning and what we've known for a long time, if you work in the safety, with safety net populations, motivational interviewing is what's needed. And that includes repeating the message, rewarding people through speaking about their abilities, not their deficits, um, getting a really good relationship in place. That really engages people to the point that they become activated and change their health. So let's talk about these uh, different factors that are affecting integration as we see it across the country. I'm very lucky to be able to travel around the country and look at um, different ways that people are doing this integration. It's a, it's a really a great privilege, and it's, it's pretty exciting. I've probably been to 12 states visiting sites that are doing integration. And what we've seen is that state-level approaches really matter. All healthcare is local and your state matters. So in Alabama, I'm going to be in Montana in um, August again, it's very different when you go there. And each state is responding to the Affordable Care Act in a different way. Many of the southern states have said we're not going to take Obamacare funding, which in some ways has worked to their advantage because they can watch some of the other states like Missouri and Vermont that did take the New York it did take the money and look at the experiments that those states are doing to see what works and doesn't work and then take the best of what other states have tried and then implement it in their states um, 
later on. So we've seen each state is doing it their own way. Each state is really its own experiment um, in how to do good health care, how to do integration. Um, states are typically using one or more of these mechanisms, Medicaid expansion, meaning uh, they take federal money and expand Medicaid to people who not only just have a disability but are, are in poverty, so expanding the Medicaid coverage to groups of people that um, are in poverty, or they're using uh, Medicaid waivers like 1115, 1915, or these 2703. I mentioned that earlier as a policy definition, health home. 2703 is the name of the waiver in the Affordable Care Act that allows states to redesign their behavioral health and physical health services to meet the needs of folks who have chronic behavioral health and physical health conditions, and several states have, have taken advantage of that. On the next slide, you'll see also that there are um, a lot of grants coming out of SAMHSA and HRSA to fund primary behavioral health care integration. Uh, you see the Certified Community Behavioral Health Center movement with 24 states uh, vying for eight, uh, eight funding sources to allow them to roll out these certified behavioral health centers. So 24 states are designing new ways of doing integration, and eight of them will be funded to actually try it out by the federal government. We see HRSA funding a lot of federally qualified health centers to do more of this integration work. HRSA is the Health Resources Services Administration, and they uh, monitor and fund the primary care safety net providers, and we see a lot of grant funding going out through HRSA. And then many states and local uh, communities are using grant money from foundations and nonprofits and other grants to do this integration work. Some are um, also looking at some states, many states, I should say, not just some, many states are looking at using managed care entities to manage the Medicaid benefit. Many states used to manage Medicaid dollars and services themselves through state departments of public health or community health. Many now have moved to having managed care companies, whether they be nonprofit or for profit, come in, take this Medicaid money, and manage the provider network. Next slide you'll see um, many states are working with their provider associations to figure out how to do this integration work. Some states are doing it better than others, but if you're in a state that has a strong primary care association or behavioral health association, um, these are definitely places that can support you in your integration, and each state, again, is doing it differently. Um, so looking at state websites across the country for primary care associations or behavioral health uh, associations or mental health associations, it's worth taking a look around the country to see what others are doing to learn from because they're doing some really interesting things. And then finally, I'll mention accountable care organizations. ACOs are an option for Medicare providers, and this came out of the Affordable Care Act, and it, it funds uh, large systems to manage the Medicare benefit in an integrated way. Medicaid at the state level has taken this idea of the accountable care organization and kind of repurposed it, renamed it. Many are calling them regional care organizations or regional integrated care organizations. In Colorado, they call them regional integrated care organizations or RICOs. This is just a different way of putting a Medicaid spin on the accountable care organization. And many of them are producing some really cool outcomes. Um, it's a bit messy, but all systems change is messy. And it's designing networks of providers around um, buckets of money, so giving provider regions or provider networks bundled amounts of money so that they can reconfigure their capacity to share data, coordinate care, and stratify costs based on level of care. Remember I mentioned that stepped care. So if you have a low level of need, it's going to cost this much versus stepped care or up where somebody needs even more money. The idea is that providers will be able to use the money more effectively than uh, a state or a managed care provider will be able to use the money by giving them fee-for-service money. If you bundle the money and give it to the provider and let them decide how to use it, there's some thought that that might be more effective. So again, there's all these experiments going on around the country, and it, a lot of it depends on 
what state you're in as to what you can do as a provider. Next slide, um, I just threw some slides in here that show um, where states are on these different issues. So for Medicaid expansion, this slide um, I should, I need to update because Louisiana starting next week is doing Medicaid expansion. But these dark green states are all states that did Medicaid expansion and the light green are the ones that are kind of looking at it. Next slide um, shows states that are doing um, managed care. So they're, they're bringing in managed care to manage the Medicaid dollars in their state. And as you can see, um, most states are doing this, whether it's a carve-in or a carve-out, whether you have managed care just doing behavioral health benefit or a carve-in where you have managed care doing both the behavioral health and the primary care benefit. On the next slide, you'll see states that took advantage of that 2703 health home waiver. That's the one I mentioned before that allows states to design specialty integrated health services for people with severe mental illness and um, chronic physical health conditions. Missouri was the first state to do this. You see Alabama, you guys are in there. Other states are coming on board. I know Montana is revving up for this, as is Louisiana. They're looking at uh, pulling money down from the federal government to redesign their system. Uh, you can do this with adults or children, and there's a lot of different ways that states are, are using these funds to develop their own version of, of integration. Next, let's just talk about regional level approaches. So we talked about some of the differences at the state level that's driving integration and allows uh, providers and state, um, state departments of community health to do different things around integration with Medicaid funding. At the regional level, this being zip code or county level, there's a lot of factors we're seeing that affect integration also. So as I mentioned, all healthcare is local. So depending on the relationships and the number of providers in a certain zip code, it really drives how you can go about doing integration. So if you're frontier or rural, it's a much different environment than urban, obviously. And we see integration happening differently there. In the frontier and rural areas, we see that providers know each other better. Um, they've been around a long time. Many of the leadership has been around a long time. And they've They've had to deal with fewer resources, so they've figured a lot of things out. So we see integration actually rolling out um, more easily sometimes in these rural frontier areas because people have been doing this kind of work for a while, this kind of care coordination, care management, collaboration. We see them struggling with things that urban centers don't struggle with, which have to do with um, technology, transportation, the ability to share data um, through health information exchanges. On the urban side, there's a lot of competition. So we see providers that really want to um, become bigger so that they can stratify costs across larger groups of patients that they serve. So care coordination might not happen very easily because people are in competition with each other. But there seems to be more resources for things like transportation and um, linking uh, electronic health records to health information exchanges. So there's strengths and opportunities regardless of where you are. Um, all providers have to understand some things about their regional marketplace if they're going to do this integration. The first thing they have to do is go to CDC websites, the Center for Disease uh, Control, HRSA websites, and really get a good understanding of your zip code population. For the people you're serving in your zip code, what's their biggest health needs and who's providing it? On the next slide, we see um, you really have to figure out how many service providers are in your area and figure out do you have a relationship or not with them. And when I'm talking service providers, I'm talking about everybody. This includes specialty care like podiatry, um, hospitals, obviously, independent physician groups, lab services, social service agencies, so those faith-based and nonprofits that are providing um, shelter and food and clothing for people. Government services, including court, police, parks, and recreation, really have to understand your market, your region, your zip code, and then figure out, are these providers doing a good job in relation to you and in relation to the people they're serving? Do you have good relationships with them? Are they easy to get along with? Um, are they producing value? Are they producing value and you want to collaborate with them, 
or are they not producing value and you want to replace them? There's a lot of competition in healthcare today, and there's a lot of coopetition, which means you realize that you're a competitor, but you also realize there's enough people in the market that need your services that you guys can collaborate together around how to meet those services. So many organizations are having to renew relationships or start relationships. Are you a stranger to the folks in your community? Have you existed in a silo and have they existed in a silo? And if that's the case, then does your CEO need to go to breakfast with their CEO and figure out where you all stand in this crazy marketplace we're all in the middle of? That kind of relationship um, partner building takes lots of time, and it takes people getting out of their comfort zones and starting to talk to one another. Many organizations I've talked to said, yeah, we tried to partner with the hospital, but they didn't want to work with us. And I say, well, when did you try partnering with the hospital? 18 months ago. What did you do? I tried calling their CEO. I got them on the phone once and said, hey, do you want to talk about how to do integration? And they said, yeah, maybe. And then I haven't followed up with them. That's not going to cut it. Or even the hospital says, no, we're not ready to partner around uh, developing a memorandum of understanding for data sharing. Um, that doesn't mean that they won't be ready next week or the week after that. So you have to be very per professionally persistent in this, this new marketplace to really figure out what are your regional level needs and what role do you play as a provider in that. Let's talk now about uh, integrated health outcomes. And I don't know, do we have any questions that have bubbled up before I, I continue on? Just stop me if we do. We have no questions um, via email, but um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can email us or call us. So please, this is an opportunity to take advantage of our expert. Thank you. Great. So let's just look at some of the outcomes related to this integration work uh, before we get into really the nitty-gritty around how to do this at, at the provider level. The, um, health, the outcomes associated with integrating healthcare services, and again, integration were, is a term that's kind of used loosely, so I'm talking about integration around uh, primary care going into behavioral health, behavioral health going into primary care, or robust care coordination between two, two providers. When we look at um, the collaborative care data or the data around bringing depression care into primary care, real robust literature, over 30 randomized controlled trials showing that this works. If you treat someone's mental illness in a primary care setting, their physical health and their behavioral health or their mental health and substance abuse do get better. On the next slide, you can see that for people with severe and persistent mental illness, we're still developing a literature around this. There was a study um, that I was privileged to be a part of that RAND did with SAMHSA HRSA for consumers that are receiving treatment in the PBHCI grants, these primary behavioral health care integration clinics. And what they found, and this was in 2010, 2011, 2012, when these grants were just getting off the ground. There's now over 120 of these grants that have been implemented. These were just the first grants. Um, they found that if you bring primary care into a community mental health behavioral health center, um, you will see improvements around things like metabolic syndrome, and different health conditions. But again, these were grants that were just getting off the ground, so the evidence is still emerging around the effectiveness. And on the next slide, you can see they didn't see, which is interesting, a huge improvement on, around people's behavioral health, and part of the reason was they weren't looking very closely at it. So this integration, we had these teams and these grantees that were putting a lot of effort into physical health, and I think many of them um, got distracted from the behavioral health stuff because it was so much work just getting them up to speed on the physical health integration. There's a new study going on right now. It's just kicking off with a bunch of these PBACI grantees. And based on the evidence we have since 2012 when this other study ended, um, we're seeing improvements across the board on physical health and behavioral health for these grantees. So we're pretty confident that the research will show uh, improvements across the board. There's a good JAMA article, next slide here, on youth. Uh, JAMA article, I think, came out the last fall, a uh, meta-study around what, is, what does integration look like for people that are kids or youth. 
And there was definitely evidence when you put the studies together to show that integration is improving health outcomes. Um, and there was also evidence to show that um, these integrated models were, were helpful for substance abuse, too, which is, is really critical. Um, many of the screening brief intervention and referral for treatment, the integration of substance abuse into primary care are showing really good outcomes. Uh, so this whole notion of mental health, behavioral health, primary care integration, there still is a bit more work to be done around the outcome piece because the systems change. Many of, its, many of this research is prevention design, which is hard to prove that prevention is actually working. Um, but we just see the literature growing and growing around the effectiveness of these integration models. If we look at the next slide around cost, yes, um, it does save money. Again, um, depression treatment in primary care has been shown to have significant savings uh, for uh, primary care. The next slide, uh, you know, more evidence that I've, and the references are at the end of this slide deck if you guys want to you know, dig into these studies, but upwards of a $3,300 um, lower total health care cost over a 48-month period if you treat depression in primary care. The next slide is from Missouri, this, this graphic here showing um, their, health health, their health home outcomes. So as you remember, I mentioned Missouri was one of the first, was the first state actually to take um, the 2703 waiver money. And they designed a very specific um, integration model where they had primary health care homes, which is the left-hand side of this slide, integrating behavioral health into primary care. And on the right-hand side, community mental health centers where they put primary care into them. Both designs um, showed significant uh, reduction in, in hospitalization, rehospitalization. And actually, if you look closely at the numbers, the community mental health centers did a better job a little bit better job than the primary care centers in this, this model. Next slide just shows the overall cost savings that came out of that, uh, looking at $23 million over a couple years, or not even a, a couple years, 18 months. So there is savings to be had. Getting there is not easy, but it is, it is certainly doable. Importantly, before we move on to you know, the provider level component, um, people like it. This is uh, from an older study. Um, around older adults, uh, talking about integrated care. People really liked it. Um, next slide. Um, the patient engagement piece is really, really important because not only are people just getting engaged, but they're getting activated. And when I go around the country and visit sites, I get to talk to consumers, and the number one thing they say is, finally, people understand my whole health. I got primary care talks and behavioral health. Finally, everybody understands my trauma history, and they understand how um, to work with me in primary care and in behavioral health together. Uh, finally, I, I feel like I can spend my time changing my health behavior and doing less of my own care coordination, uh, getting my providers to talk to each other. So it's a very, um, very important component or a comp important outcome of this, this healthcare integration work is this satisfaction customers have with with uh, receiving this integration. So next, let's look at these provider-level approaches. So we've talked about national drivers. We've talked about state and regional um, impact on the ability to integrate. And we talked about some of the outcomes associated with integration. Let's get into the nitty-gritty around the provider level. So this, this is going to, we're going to talk about um, how two or more organizations go about integrating together. So this, Next slide has a standard framework for integration. This came out of work done years ago by C.J. Peake and others. The SAMHSA took this and developed six levels of integration. So on the left-hand side, you have level one. This is siloed-based bad care. This is our old historic healthcare system we're moving away from where providers don't talk to each other. Minimal collaboration. Typically, providers are just talking together if the patient makes them talk together or if a patient gets into real significant problems with the court, police, something like that, then providers end up talking to each other. That's bad health care. On the right-hand side, we have level six integration, which is 
one organization where a primary care provider and a behavioral health provider either merge or um, evolve into being able to provide all services to all patients. Level six is not where you should be shooting for because it's too difficult. It's great if you can get there, but that's not the expectation around integration. Integration is not about, you know, necessarily having all staff at one location working out of the same office. Great if you can do it. Great if you can have one EHR. Great if you can have one CEO. Great if you can have one treatment plan. Um, but few organizations are able to get there. The sweet spot is in the middle of this continuum, which is getting to these level three, level four or at the very, very least getting to a really good level two where you still have separate facilities but you're sharing resources so well that primary care and behavioral health are able to, when they see a patient, see exactly what happened across town when they were providing, when they received services from that other provider. So in the next slide, you see a deeper dive into each one of these levels. So as I mentioned, level one on the left-hand side, um, Really, just separate systems. People aren't communicating well. They're only communicating if they absolutely have to. Level two, you got basic collaboration at a distance. So you've got separate systems, but you've got memorandums of understanding. You're starting to share secure email with patient data. You're um, looking at uh, consent, making sure everybody knows who you're talking to um, when you're talking with a patient about their health care. And everybody's looking at what each other is able to do. So this is kind of that mapping piece I talked about, understanding what, who, who's doing what in your provider network, your community. Level three is when you start doing some basic collaboration on site. Maybe you have a social worker going to the ER um, when someone shows up in the ER and doing a behavioral health screen. Maybe you have a social worker embedded in a, a community health clinic, primary care clinic. Or maybe you have a nurse practitioner from community medicine a community um, primary care provider coming to a community mental health center one day a week and seeing patients. This is collaboration that's really driven by specific needs that each of the providers have, and they've decided to come together. I've been to many organizations that have this level three, and it feels like a level one because the primary care might be on site with behavioral health, but nobody's talking to each other. It's almost they have separate reception areas separate doorways. For the patient, it doesn't feel integrated at all. A hallmark of a really good integrated site is that the patient doesn't feel the same. They come in, they receive their care, and they just feel as though everybody's their care provider. It's one big team. It's not separate people. Getting there, easier said than done. On the next slide, you see the level four folks where there's a lot more collaboration. There's people talking to each other. There's team members talking to each other. They're starting to see themselves as a team, their roles are beginning to become blended and their cultures are beginning to be blended. Primary care provision is a totally different culture than behavioral health provision. Substance abuse care, if you're a straight up substance abuse provider, that's a different culture than a mental health provider. These cultures have to be understood and they have to be integrated. That's why I talked about terms at the beginning of this presentation. Terms drive culture because terms define mental models and defined behaviors. So understanding each other's culture, each other's scope of work, scope of practice, really critical if you're going to get teams to work closely together. Then we get into the level five folks where people are have two separate records, but they're sharing information. Um, they're coming together frequently in person to have huddles or team meetings, whether it's once a week or once a day. Um, they really think of themselves as one team. And then level six, you just have one organization that's fully integrated. We've seen a lot of community mental health centers that have decided to go after FQHC status and get an FQHC new access point funding. We've seen a lot of FQHCs that have decided to go to the state and say, hey, we want to become a community mental health provider. Um, it just makes it easier for some organizations, not all. It's not an expectation, um, but for some organizations, it's, it's the way to go. Next slide, um, you can see... As I talk about this, this is really not just a simple um, implementation of one strategy. This is a systems level change. So the organizational components that are going to be impacted by doing this integration work are all of your organizational components because everything's got to change. So your staffing, your building design even, you know, how you structure your waiting room might change. 
Your partnerships and contracting, how you currently relate to partners across town are going to have to change. How you fund this is going to have to be looked at. How do you fund care coordination? How do you get money as a behavioral health provider from a primary care or a hospital system if you're helping them reduce rehospitalization? Uh, how do you develop a shared savings program with them? That has to be looked at. Clinical practice. Uh, all, all primary care providers are going to have to learn how to do motivational interviewing. They're doing a lot of the components of motivational interviewing, but we find that a lot of primary care providers still have a little bit of work to do there as well as behavioral health, frankly. On the behavioral health side, all the behavioral health clinicians have to learn about how to have a meaningful conversation with somebody about diabetes, chronic constructive pulmonary disease, asthma, immunization, um, obesity, all these conditions that are killing people have to be part of the discussion and part of the treatment planning that a behavioral health clinician engages in, and that takes training and, and education. Health information technology and use, that has to really be hammered. It's very, very difficult to share data right now through health information exchanges and between electronic health records, but it is getting better. Uh, we see it getting better across the country. That has to be looked at, this ability to do population health management. Staff have to be able to understand how to cut uh, data, how to look at data, how to develop dashboards within your EMR, or develop Excel spreadsheets to do it. Simple Excel spreadsheets can have really powerful impact on teams and understanding what teams are doing well and not doing well when it comes to stepping people up and down to care. The next, next slide, you know, your quality assurance, continuous quality improvement has to be turned on and really used. Um, quite a bit to figure out how to do this integration work. You have to do these iterative processes of plan, do, study, act, um, rapid cycle improvement uh, to move teams in the direction you want your organization to go in. Marketing, you know, how are you going to market your brand to other providers, to other community payers? How are you going to get out there and explain what your vision for integration is? And then finally, customer service. Uh, looking at new ways to meet the needs of your customer. If you have a high no-show rate, why is that? What can you do about that? Do you need to do just-in-time prescribing? Do you need to look at revamping your same-day, next-day access? Uh, do you need to shorten your intake? Many behavioral health providers have upwards of three to five-hour first appointments for customers. That's not very customer-friendly. Uh, people don't want to come back to that, and that's part of the reason for the, the no-shows. When we look at what organizations should think about when their integration, when they're, they're setting off on doing this integration work. It's good to be reminded by nutting work here in this slide, implementing integrated health model components. They vary in difficulty, and this is just something to keep in mind. All the things I'm saying might feel overwhelming. I know I talk fast, um, and I'm giving you guys a lot of information. You don't have to do it all at once. You just start down a path. You start by doing one thing at a time. And you start by understanding what's in this slide, which is it's easier to implement um, discrete model components, maybe something like same-day, next-day access, or developing a dashboard to know if people are getting better or not, than it is to change staff roles and staff work patterns. Getting people to change their workloads is really difficult, kind of like losing weight. Simple concept. You know, eat better food, exercise more. Hard, hard, hard to do and to sustain. So just know that as staff, as leadership, that it's easier to do some things than others, and you want to start with early wins. So pick some things that are going to be easy for you to do out of the gate, and then also get working on changing staff behavior by taking the time to really define what you want to do with this integration work and what you don't want to do. On next, next slide, you see, you know, same-day scheduling and e-prescribing was far easier than getting uh, team-based care, interdisciplinary teams, and population health management in place. So knowing that as a leader, as an organization moving down the road towards integration, it doesn't mean you don't do population health management or, or look at team-based care. It just means you have a long view, and you take the time to market it well to your staff, define your terms, and develop a really good, um, work plan to do that. So on the next slide, factors influencing model design and adoption. So if you're looking at, okay, 
Jeff, this is all sounds very interesting. Where do we start? This is where you start. You start with looking at your organization's vision. Why do you guys exist? Many of us brush over this notion that, oh, we exist, you know, provide good care. But in today's marketplace, why do you exist? You're in a market where even if you're rural and there's nobody around you, there are FQHCs, there are other providers looking to move into your marketplace. So what is your organization's brand? What is your vision? Do you want to bring primary care on site as behavioral health, or do you not want to do that? There's no right answer to that question. The only right answer is knowing exactly where you want to be in a year, in three years, in five years. So the senior management really has to define its brand, its vision for why it exists, and know how to roll out this, this change it's expecting of its uh, staff. So having the organizational capacity to change is critical. And many of us have been doing the same thing for a long time, so this ability to change is really hard. Change is the only constant we see in healthcare. It's not going to, things are not going to settle down for the foreseeable future. So leadership's job is really to define the organization's vision and strategy for the next one, three, five years as best it can. It'll change over time, which is fine. Really define its organizational capacity to change. Do you have change technology within your organization? Does your staff change easily, or does it take them a long time? Is there resources you can bring in to help your organization change? And then understanding the funding piece, understanding your cost. Do you have high no-shows that's burning money? Do you have a lot of uh, staff that aren't doing collaborative documentation or concurrent documentation that's doing their documentation after the appointment? That's burning money. Do you have different things in your organization that you could save money on today if you changed. Knowing that as leadership is really important as you move down this path towards integration. On the, other, the next slide, number four, understanding your organization's ability to capture, manage, and share information. Uh, if you have an electronic health record, you might not like it, but it's better than being on paper. So if you're on paper, you know, are you looking at it, getting an electronic health record? Are you able to extract data from your paper into Excel? You need to look at some basic steps to be able to begin to capture, manage, and share data. This is the hallmark of an organization that's going to be able to survive in this, this climate of change. Provider network, as I mentioned before, who does what? Who gets along with whom? Who's in your provider network? What's your relationship with them? So I'm going to wrap up by digging into three um, aspects. I'm going to take a deeper dive in, and I'm hoping this will generate some questions as we move um, into the top of the hour here. I'm going to talk about organizational change management, how do organizations change effectively to do integration, creating and maintaining partnerships, some of the things we've learned around what works and what doesn't work in partnerships and then redesign your administrative and your clinical care path, your, your administrative workflows in your clinical care pathways. So as a leadership, there's a few things that you guys are responsible for in your organization. As I mentioned before, you're responsible for defining the brand, the vision, and clearly understanding why you exist, you know, what is the purpose of your existence. The what is what do you want to do in this marketplace today? So why do we exist? We exist to serve people and improve their health. Okay, pretty clear. What do you do to do that? Do you want to do primary care and behavioral health? The marketplace will pay for that. Or do you want to do just behavioral health? You could do both or just one. How are you going to do that? Once you define what you're going to do, given this change, how are you going to do it? You know, what is it going to look like? Do you have a change management technology? Does your senior leadership use the evidence-based practice of change management? There's a lot of books out there on how to get organizations to change, whether it's Patrick Lencioni's work, uh, Cotter's work out of Harvard. There's a big literature that explains how organizations change effectively, and it's all about having good leadership. So if you don't have any technology around that or if you're curious, have your leadership team, read one of these books and follow it. It'll walk you down the path around how to change your organization in this difficult marketplace. One of the biggest problems we see in organizations is they don't have a good leadership communication plan. So leadership says, hey, we're going to do this integration stuff. State of Alabama wants us to. We're going to do it. Um, 
go ahead, middle manager, start doing it. Here's this presentation this guy named Jeff did. You know, listen to that and go do it. That is a failed implementation. Senior management has to be really clear on your brand, on the funding, how you're going to stay and keep the lights on and people employed. So they have to have the funding piece down. And then they have to have a really good marketing and communication plan to the community and to their staff. So all senior management has to be clear on your terms and have crystal clear clarity around what they want their organization to do. So having a really clear statement of work that says, okay, champions, okay, middle managers, we're going to do this integrated health stuff. The senior management team has decided we're not going to bring primary care on site as behavioral health, but we are going to better link and coordinate um, care between us and primary care. And our charge to you is our work statement to you or our charter, whatever you want to call it, to you as middle managers is to develop a work plan that by next year is going to get us in a better relationship with our primary care providers and sharing data with our primary care providers around the things that are, are killing our behavioral health consumers, the physical health things that are killing our behavioral health consumers. That's your charge. Then on the next slide, you see the champions that are going to take that charge from leadership have to define the action steps, who's going to be accountable for what, measures, the timeline, the resource requirements for actually delivering on that charge that leadership has given them. And that means you've got to put a good work plan together that's realistic. It's not going to try to do everything all at once. It's going to go week to week, month to month. We're going to move forward, and we're going to do gradual change across our organization that's effective. And senior leadership is going to monitor that work plan, resource that work plan, and most importantly, use their communication plan to explain to staff why you're doing this, what it looks like, and how it's going to be done. There has to be real clarity and alignment um, between senior management and your work plan teams that are rolling out this change across your organization. If it's not done um, effectively, it just fizzles. It takes years to get anything done. So we really, we have examples of this if you want it um, that we can share with you guys. But it has to be really clear. Your work plans have to be really, really clear. On the next slide, while you're doing this, you really have to be doing your map. So looking at who you're partnering with, who are you not partnering, and why, and really mapping out your provider network. Who's providing what services where? Where are they located? Um, who, if any, providers are sharing your consumers? If you're a behavioral health provider and you know that a primary care provider down the road is seeing most of your consumers or a large portion of your consumers, then that's the place you want to start your partnerships with so that you can you have shared clients and you can make the most change or affect the most change for that group of clients. And you're more likely to have that partner say, yeah, I want to partner with you because we share a lot of the same folks that are, that are struggling. You've got to look at your capacity to share data and your partner's capacity to share data. Um, if you've got a paper record, that's fine. There's ways to share data out of a paper record. you just got to figure it out. We're more than happy to help you with that. Next slide, willingness to sign a business associates agreement or a memorandum of understanding. You've got to, um, once you've defined who you're going to partner with, got to develop a memorandum of understanding that's going to allow you to share data and define your relationship. We have lots of examples of what those look like. We can share them with you. Um, it is a legal document and it does incorporate um, HIPAA or health information protections within it that allow you to share data. So this willingness and ability to share data is the hallmark of good integration. You can't coordinate care well if you're not sharing data well. On the next slide, um, once you've defined who you're going to partner with, you go to them and you really need to be clear about what you want from them and you really need to be clear on what your costs are and what your data requirements are. So as leaders, again, you have to be clear on the money piece. You've got to be clear on your data collection capacity piece before you go to the table with your partner so that when you get there, you guys can have a, a really good conversation about the business opportunities you both have in this marketplace around coordinating care. So who's going to pay for what? What are your needs? What are their needs? Always good to approach any relationship by saying, you know, 
what what do you need? What do you see in this marketplace? You know, we see things changing in Alabama or in whatever state we're in. What do you see your needs are? Start with that, and then when they tell you what their needs are, you can move to yours, and because you've done your homework and you know your basic uh, cost of care, you know what data you can and can't share or you're in the process of figuring out to share, then you can have a meaningful conversation around, well, this is what we we need from you if we're going to do this integration, this coordination piece. So do your homework before you engage with providers um, that you want to partner with. If and when you start partnering, um, or even before you start partnering, there's a lot of good integrated health assessment tools you can use. Um, you can do it as a partnership. If you've got a good relationship with somebody, you can both fill out. There's uh, the IPAT, which is the Integration Practice Assessment Tool. There's, there's all sorts of tools you can, you can take that will tell you, will give you a barometer, or, or will give you a good indication of where your organization in, is in in its capacity to do integration. So everything from financing to clinical care to care coordination. So use one of these tools. You can do it with your partner um, and do it together, and you can find out where your strengths and your opportunities areas are. Have the business associates agreements in place um, as soon as you can, because once those are signed, and sometimes they take a while to get signed by lawyers and all that sort of thing, you can really um, start doing that data sharing piece, which is really, really important. Um, once your partnership is in place, um, make sure that your senior leadership is meeting on a regular basis. So at least for the first year, um, we recommend that you guys meet at least monthly just to see how things are going. You know, you've charged your work groups with getting this rollout done. Um, you're looking at uh, the marketplace. You're looking at what's happening nationally and at the state level, and you're talking to each other about how's it going. We see many partnerships fail because they get their memorandum of understanding together and then they don't meet for six months and things change. Things are changing so quickly today in today's healthcare marketplaces that they come back together and one provider says, yeah, we're, we're not going to move forward or we can't do it or we hit this barrier and um, you're thinking to yourself, oh, man, I could have helped them with that if we had just known about it. So keep the conversation alive. Regularly discuss cost and data care coordination metrics. Don't be afraid of discussing money. You've got to talk about money up front or you'll never get to it. Make sure your middle managers that are, that are executing this work plan you've charged them with are talking with each other on both sides and that people are in alignment around what administrative workflows and what clinical pathways need to change to begin this, this integration work. And just a note on confidentiality, many people hide behind confidentiality and say, oh, we're a behavioral health provider, we can't share data, that's why we can't partner. And um, that's just not true. We have seen no big lawsuits around the country um, around developing shared consent, around data sharing using a business associates agreement. Um, lots of healthcare data can be shared between providers through a simple uh, consent for treatment. You don't need individual consent for data sharing each time you want to share things. Having said that, and the next slide, um, there are exceptions. You know, HIV, substance abuse treatment, um, sometimes it's, it's a no. You can't share data easily, and you got to kind of figure it out. Sometimes there are stricter state or local laws um, that prevent data sharing. But Talk with your legal counsel. Remember, what your lawyer suggests to you isn't a court decision. It's different. You as leadership can make decisions. Learn from whatever, what other providers have done that are further down the road. Talk to other folks that have done this. We have many organizations that are doing shared consent. So let's wrap up by talking about um, redesigning uh, your administrative workflows and your clinical care pathways. I don't know if you can see it on this slide, but it's just a graphic at the top showing an activated client who's producing good health outcomes as a result of some good care provision. All care provision in an organization is built from a foundation of policies and procedures, right? You have policies that say this is what we aspire to, this is what we will do. You have procedures that clearly articulate at a behavioral level what staff should do. On the one hand, on the left-hand side, you've got administrative workflows. These are things staff do that are back office things. 
everything from how they use sick time to how they bill for things to how they enter data into the electronic health record. On the other hand, you also have clinical pathways. These are the clinical um, procedures, behaviors your staff engage with with the patient. The clinical pathways and the administrative pathways have to be standardized so that you can pull valid structured data and so you know your cost of care and you know your effectiveness to care, your clinical outcome. When you're doing integrated health, as I mentioned, it's a system change thing. So on both levels, both the administrative and the clinical level, you're going to have to look at how you deliver care and make it more efficient and make it more effective. Sounds like a lot of work, but you just start somewhere, and over time, things get better. Next slide. So if we're looking at the administrative workflows, we have seen for organizations that are doing integration, collaborative concurrent documentation has to be done. Same day, next day access, access to care, just in time prescribing really has to be done to reduce those no-shows. These are evidence-based practices that will save you money. And I really see collaborative concurrent documentation, this way of entering data into your electronic health record as a burnout prevention device for staff. If your staff are doing their notes, you know, on Fridays or at home or, you know, after an appointment, they're wasting their time and they're going to get burned out. Once they learn how to do this collaborative concurrent documentation, they will never want to go back. But it's a big hurdle for supervisors to get staff to do that. Team-based care, having teams huddle and talk to each other, really something to shoot for. It's something that creates incredible efficiency. Data sharing, population health management. These are administrative processes that have to happen. You have to be sharing data between providers, and you have to be looking at whether your treat-to-target metrics are being achieved or not. On the clinical side, all staff have to be trained in motivational interviewing, both on the primary care side, behavioral health care side. Administrative staff and clinical staff should receive motivational interviewing. Front desk staff should receive an orientation to motivational interviewing because it's about good customer service. It also allows you to stratify your level of care. So we, we have to, as providers, be looking at what is the minimum level of medical necessity that somebody needs and how do we step people up and down to care around that. Motivational interviewing gets that whether people are pre-contemplative, they don't want your help, contemplative, oh, they're kind of interested in hearing what you have to say, or whether they're active state, they're actually activated, they're going to do the work of improving their health. Motivational interviewing is an evidence-based practice that can both provide better patient activation but helps you stratify your population and better understand your cost. That's why it's really important that you implement it. All staff on the behavioral side have to learn how to um, assess for and at least collaborate with primary care around diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, respiratory diseases, and other conditions that might be um, killing your clients. On the behavioral health side, um, on the primary care side, they need to be learning behavioral health uh, pathways around depression, suicide screening, and eventually, as primary care gets better, as they can start treating complex bipolar, schizoaffective, schizophrenia, these collaborations between behavioral health and primary care create clinicians that are just better at delivering whole health care. So that helps the whole system because behavioral health can start to step people down into primary care earlier and open their front door to receiving more folks who have behavioral health needs because oftentimes communities have more behavioral health needs than they have behavioral health providers to do it. Finally, um, developing care pathways around social determinants of health. On the behavioral health side, we've typically done this pretty well, looking at the person in context, looking at poverty, looking at housing, looking at natural support. Primary care understands the importance of social determinants. They just haven't been paid to do it. Now with these collaborations, we can start to collaborate around how to do this, how to get to people in their home, how to get to people in their community, because that's when you really start to see the reasons why people's health isn't good, and that's where we really have the tools to activate people when we're in their environment. In an exam room, it's hard to do activation. So having said all this, and I know I've said a lot, 
Um, let's move to having some uh, questions answered if you guys have any um, on clarifying this or any aspect. And I'm, of course, interested in what, you know, what have you started doing? On what ground have you covered? What, what barriers are you hitting? What questions remain? Dr. Dr. Capo, Bianca, we do have a question that came in via email, and they asked, what is the best way to include social workers, nurses, and other disciplines in the planning process and then keeping them involved in the process? Well, the first thing you've got to do is your senior management has to define what does integration mean for you as an organization. Are you going to, you know, do full integration? Do you want to do good care coordination? Because that's going to define the message you're going to tell your staff. Then the senior management has to come up with a communication plan. And in the communication plan, your senior management is designing a marketing approach that's going to activate your staff to both understand what you mean by integration, so they understand what my scope of work, scope of practice is going to look like, what do I stop doing? What do I keep doing the same? What do I do differently? That's what staff care about. They come to work every day and work hard, and they're, they're not focused on big picture stuff. So senior management has to be constantly in their face communicating, hey, this is what integration means for you, social worker. This is what we want you to stop doing. This is what we want you to do differently. This is what we want you to do the same. That has to happen in the context of a dialogue. You can't just deliver it to staff, right, because then they'll resist it. So there's three types of staff we've seen in organizations. There are champions who you just hope don't burn out. You watch them to make sure they don't, and you watch them to make sure they don't run off in some you know, new way of doing things or that they get too far ahead of the organization around change. Champions are people that get it from the get-go and they work towards it. So they get what integration is like, yes, I'm a social worker. I want to learn about diabetes. I want to learn about how to better coordinate care with primary care. Then you have the confused staff. These are most of your staff. These are folks that don't understand the terms. They don't understand how this fits in the big picture of things. And these are the folks that senior management hasn't sat down with and explained, this is how your job is going to change. This is what information we want from you to help us around how to change our organization because you're a knowledge expert as a frontline staff. You have the expertise around the how of doing this. We want to hear from you. You want to get your confused to become champions, right? You don't Confused staff won't execute well on change in your organization. You have the champions, you have the confused, and then you have the resistance. If you have supervisors that are resistant, you got problems. If you have frontline staff that are resistant, you have problems. Resistant staff aren't nasty staff that just don't want to do stuff. Resistant staff are ones that are getting a divorce at home, who um, don't like their job, are poorly fit to their job, and either need a job change or they need to be moved along. Your supervisors and your senior management have to be assessing all disciplines for their, their level. Are they at a champion level? Are they confused? Are they resistant? Your supervisors are your most important staff when it comes to creating change in your organization because they've got a foot in leadership, they've got a foot on the front line, and if your supervisors are confused or resistant, your staff will not change their behavior and make this integration work. The team culture, the supervisor controls the team culture. Oftentimes, team culture is stronger than your organization culture. That's why as senior management, you really have to work closely with your supervisors to assess your organization each discipline and get their buy-in, get their confusion taken care of so that they agree with you that, yes, we're going to move down this path towards integration. We're going to do it using our work plan that we developed with them, the frontline staff, and we're going to do it on a week-by-week, month-by-month, quarter-by-quarter, measured basis. And we're not going to do it all at once. Next, you know, we might even pick one, you know, physical health condition we're going to address this year. Maybe we're going to attack smoking cessation. Maybe we're going to attack diabetes because we've looked at the data and that's what's killing most of our people. And we're going to do an all-staff rollout on diabetes. And then next year we're going to tackle cardiovascular disease or in six months. But doing a really measured, deliberate uh, way of rolling it out. Each discipline will have its own um, issues when it comes to doing integration, whether they're social worker or peer staff, front desk staff, 
psychiatrists. They all have their own take on what they should stop doing, what they should do differently, what they should keep doing the same. And you really need to spend the time using your supervisors to assess um, where they are in that change process. We have another question that's just come in. When talking with our community health centers and primary care providers, are there any financial disadvantages that need to be addressed before we discuss integration? Well, so financial disadvantages, I can look at that in two ways. Care coordination, there's a lot of, so states and the federal government are typically three to five years behind funding and innovation. They typically fund it with grants or waivers, which are blunt objects or blunt ways to fund things. Without grants, without a billing code to fund things like care coordination, um, emails, texting, phone calls, there are financial um, holes that you step in when you're partnering. So if you're going to partner with a hospital, you're going to partner with a primary care center or behavioral health center, you have a vision for what that partnership is going to look like. We're going to, we're going to coordinate care well. We're going to share data well. We're going, to, we're going to move staff between our organizations more efficiently. That's going to cost money from the standpoint of staff effort just to develop the work plan and execute it, the time staff are putting into this change. But it's also going to put you guys at risk because unless you have a billing code for care coordination or some way to pay for it, it's going to cost you money. So that's why you really have to have your business cap on when you're having these conversations and define where are you going to lose money, where are you going to break even, where could you possibly make money, and how much money can you burn before you become at risk. Well, many hospitals um, and large health care primary care providers don't like talking money and data because they don't like to share um, their risk, they don't like to share their data in the market because they might be in competition with another provider down the road. So these, these conversations aren't easy, but you have to define, hey, what do we have for shared vision? We have the same population of people we're serving. How could we better serve them? And then what would it cost? What would be the risk around cost? What would be some possible solutions around cost, whether it be grants or codes you can bill? Um, what are we willing to eat? I'll eat this cost if you eat that cost. You know, do we have some general fund dollars? Do we have some money in our rainy day fund we could use? I don't know if that got at that answer. Thank you. Um, the other thing that um, we have a question on is most of our communities in Alabama are rural communities. And when you talk about senior management, it really doesn't apply to that rural provider out in one of our rural communities. Yeah. So can you sort of address more of the yeah. rural aspect to this? Because there's no senior management. Sometimes it's one doctor in a practice um, trying to just keep up with patient flow. Yep. So can you help us understand from that perspective um, sort of how to approach an integration? Yeah, model? so the rural practices we've seen are a little bit of an advantage um, when it comes to a couple factors related to integration. The partnership piece is usually um, more clearly defined because you've had to work with the same partners for years. So although you might not even like um, your colleague across town, you've figured out how to work together. Many of the managers are also clinicians, so they have these multiple roles. You know, there's a medical director, but they provide, you know, every, the scope of work, scope of practice issue, right? Scope of work is what everybody could do. You could all take the trash out, right? And we all rise to the occasion as a team member when you have to. Scope of practice is what you get paid for, it's top of the license stuff. So with rural clinics, you have a lot of blur between scope of work, scope of practice. So it's no different. It, in some ways, it's easier because you as a team then come together and you create that work plan together and you identify who at the table is confused, who's the champion, and who's you know not wanting to do this, who's resistant. And sometimes the resistant folks have really good reasons. It's easy to flip a resistant person into a champion if you spend the time with them to say, why don't you want to do this? You know, why doesn't this make sense to you? They might just have a really good angle on it, and you go, oh, you do want to do this, but you're just saying you don't want to do it this way. All right, I agree. Let's not do it that way. And then that person becomes a champion. So in the small clinic, if you've got five staff, and they're all the clinicians, and they're all the leadership, 
you still have to develop a work plan. You still have to develop a communication plan that's going to explain to your stakeholders, your families, your consumers, and your partners who you are, what you want to do, how you're going to get there. You still have to um, hold yourself to your work plan and the metrics and the timeline. You have to create urgency within your organization to achieve the outcomes you want to achieve for yourself. So in some ways it's a little easier because you don't have, you know, 10 supervisors that are coming to the table and all advocating for their teams and not wanting to do it or wanting to do it, you've got a smaller group of people. But the change management, um, evidence-based, you know, Patrick Lencioni's work, John Cotter's work at Harvard, even some of Michael Porter's work at Harvard, it still applies to small organizations. You don't get a pass on doing good change management just because you're a small organization. Thank you. And we had another question come in, and this this question has to do with ambulance providers. Yes. I would be interested in whether ambulance is being considered to allow for transports to mental health centers rather than yes. ERs. So how do they fit yes. in? So, again, another advantage of rural communities. You look at North Carolina, you look at Louisiana. They are developing community paramedic programs. I was a paramedic years ago. Wish I had the training um, that they're getting. So basically, paramedic EMTs are being used to do substance abuse screenings and mental health screenings to prevent transportation to emergency rooms. Um, they're also being trained in crisis intervention so that they can help people stay safe, so doing suicide screens. So paramedics can be, and EMTs can be really valuable um, partners in communities to keep people in communities and not getting them into the hospitals and the ER. Where we've seen this work best is emergency room attending doctors develop policies with their ambulance providers that clearly articulate what an ambulance provider is going to do as an extender of the emergency room doctor's license. So you have to get police and emergency room doctor leaders together and developing policy and procedure around what EMTs are going to do and what your crisis mobile teams, if you have them, are going to do in collaboration with police and ambulance. There's a lot of confusion on the scene between crisis workers, ambulance, and police. And typically, police just take the person to the ER because it's the mm -hmm. safest and sure. simplest way to do it, but it's expensive. So I really um, see community paramedics as being a great uh, resource. Well, we are coming to the end of um, our hour and a half, and I just want to thank... Dr. Capobianco for um, spending this time with us. And I think that if you all have any further questions or comments, we do have um, an, the email address. Please email your questions, and we will get those to Dr. Capobianco um, in follow-up. And we also just want to thank everybody for joining us today for, and thank the Behavioral Health Council for um, helping us put this on. So we appreciate everybody's time. Dr. Capobianco, thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about, and we look forward to continuing on this topic. Thank you so much.